are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of experts. Now joining me today is Joanna Leggett, co-founder of Leggett Immobilier, French property experts, all the way via Zoom from France. Hello Joanna, how are you? Hi Stephen, very well, thank you. Nice to be back. Well, we usually have you over at this time of year for the shopping, don't we? You've missed out this year. (laughs) I've missed out this year completely. (laughs) Oh, well, we'll try and make it up one way or another. And joining Joanna is John Howard, property developer, mentor, author, public speaker, and Property TV's personality of the year. No, I'm only kidding. How are you, John? I definitely wouldn't be that. You haven't mentioned my new show, Property Graduate, of course, which is now showing at the moment on uh, on, on Sky. I don't have to mention it, John. Everybody's seen That's it. That's very good. It's Excellent. taking starring just, role on... I just thought I'd mention it. Taking starring role on Sky 191. Anyway, <laughs> welcome back to you, John. Thank you. Um, okay, um, let's get on with the questioning. And um, the first question is for you, Joanna. Um, I'm hoping to buy a chalet near the Alps, primarily for skiing in the winter, but also for the occasional summer holiday. When comparing buying in a Swiss resort as opposed to a French one, Although the locations are not physically far apart and the properties are of a similar specification, there seems to be a big difference in price, with Switzerland being much more expensive. Could the experts offer some pointers on the pros and cons of each country in terms of this kind of purchase and the associated costs? Um, Okay, yeah, so we start obviously with the... um with the Swiss properties, I mean, obviously I'm not an expert on the Swiss properties, but the salaries and et cetera are a lot higher there, which does mean that the properties are more expensive than they are in most of the French Alps. Um, A lot of people don't move so much or sell so much in um, Switzerland as they do in France, which means that when the properties do come on the market, they sell quite quickly, but they're also quite rare. Um, Again, this is another thing to push up property prices um, in Switzerland. Um, in France, you've got um, you know you've got re- resorts like Saint Gervais or Samoan, which are still just as beautiful as they are with the chocolate box looks in Switzerland, but much less in price. If you look at Verbier, for example, you're looking at nearly twenty four thousand per square metre, whereas if you look at Samoan or Saint Gervais, you're looking at about. 4,300 or 3,900 per square meter in San Gervais. So the prices in Switzerland are about four times as much. This means that France is obviously, um, you, you, you can easily find something that's gonna fit within your budget, whether it's like a studio apartment for 75,000 or a beautiful chalet at 2 million. There's a lot more choice and a lot more properties on the market. The other thing as well is the distance from Geneva, because if you were looking at Verbier, for example, you're looking at at least two hours uh, in journey time, whereas um, Saint-Gervais, for example, is under an hour. Um, So again, if you're transporting, going between Geneva and um, those resorts, it is a lot easier to get to France. And with Saint-Gervais, it's also a motorway route, so it's quite quick. It's not the twisty roads that you might get in other areas. Um, so I would say that it's, it, France is much better value for money. You can still have the beautiful resorts like you have in Switzerland with a chocolate box look as they have in Switzerland or even Austria, for example. Um, but it suits more people's budgets. And it's you've got great snow. You've got exactly the same snow in, in France as you'd have in Switzerland, depending on the different resorts. Um, so I would personally choose France, of course. <laughs> Well, I, do you know what, Joan? I have to agree with you. You're talking to somebody who used to have a property in Switzerland, and I, oh, what a surprise! I, I eh? What a surprise! I don't, I, don't, I don't think I don't think I've got enough fingers to count the number of taxes you have to pay in Switzerland. There's the army taxes, the local taxes, That's the interesting. government tax. I, all I sorts assume of things. the property price was so much more expensive in Switzerland because of the tax because of the no, tax situation. No, it, it, not. it's unbelievable the add-ons right. that you get. Secondly, of course. You can't sell to anybody. You need permission to sell to a foreigner, and right. it's only in certain areas that they allow that to happen. They allowed you to buy one. Well, they allowed me to buy one, yeah. but they didn't allow me to sell to a foreigner. Right, gotcha. So it's a little yeah. bit of a difficult market from that point of view, and I'd go with Joanna. I think I Definitely, think without France question, is France has got to be the answer, yeah. isn't it? 
Yeah. Got so to. there you are, Joanna. You've won, you've won that one hands down. It does suit every budget in France. So you can have a small budget and still get a great property, or you can have a lovely, you know, a great big budget and get an amazing chalet. But, you know, bearing in mind, Switzerland can be four times the cost of France. But of course, again, the, the other disadvantage of buying in Switzerland is very little inflation. And wow. I, I can remember buying, I sold some, some years later, and I remember then going back 10 years after that, mm. I looked at my property, which happened to be on the market again, and it hadn't gone up a cent, you know, mm. uh, it just stayed the same price as I bought. Why didn't you buy in France then? Why didn't you? I don't know, really. I you hadn't met uh, Joanna by then, so. Well, yeah. no, I, I was probably misled by somebody else. So they will. Some anyway, some lady, no, no good doubt. answer, Joanna. Thank you very much indeed. I don't suppose you've got much to add to that one, John. Not at all. I can't afford Switzerland. OK. All right. Well, we'll get on with your question then. Right. I've read a lot about the government's new help to build scheme. I would welcome some advice and the thoughts of the experts on whether this really is a viable proposition for somebody who has no construction or development knowledge. I think I know the answer to that yeah, one. Uh, thanks very much. What a what a what a what a good question. Mm. I've got a good question. So the government are really hell bent on on self build. They believe that that is the future. Uh, I mean, certainly in Germany and and, and other countries, you know, self build take is quite a large part of the market. In the UK, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the market. So what they're trying to do is is make up to forty percent. Um, 40% of the costs available on a on a, 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 a some sort of loan from the government on top of a top up loan if you like on top of the the mortgage you'd get to to help you build these homes, um, but I, I don't see it taking off in the same way as as, as as in Europe. We're totally we think differently, we do things differently, and of course in in Europe they haven't got these big house builders like we have in the UK. You know, people like Persimmon Homes build 35,000 houses a year. Mm. 235,000 houses are built every year in the UK. It needs to be 500,000. So and that's what the government is seeing. They, they want small developers and any, anybody with less, who builds less than 500 houses or homes is considered small. So most of the people watching this show, including me and others like us, are small developers. We're all, we're all put in the same camp, if you like. Uh, but then below that, they're trying to encourage um, self-build, and I think that's a I think that's a big task. It, there's so many challenges with self-build for people who aren't that I, experienced. I, I, I think it's madness. I cannot see how it's going to work. The, I the, agree. I, the thought you get the odd person doing yeah, it. Yeah, the, the thought of young people entering into sort of construction contracts yeah. and and arrangements with builders yeah, I mean, who are helping. Yeah, if they, work, if they work for a construction company, that might mm. work quite well for them. Yeah. But it's very complicated, and I'm very I'm, I, well. It's just typical naivety from a government. Who, who think everything's much simpler than it is, to be honest with you. I think the other thing, John, is that um, I know when we had that scheme down here in Docklands many years ago, um, people went ahead, they borrowed money from their bank and, yeah. and, and built these houses. But then these houses turned out to be unmortgageable in, in, in the usual way. Yeah. And I have a feeling that although I know the government are keen to put in place funding for this help to yeah. build. So like and, a top and, up, top up. Yeah, that's a top up. Stroke and, loan, and, isn't it? Really? And you go to, your, go to your bank and have, yeah. have whatever percentage it is you need. Yeah. But I worry that the second sale, mm. when you sell it on, well, is going to have a problem. Well, it, it they're not going to have NHBC no, guarantees it or anything. No, but it shouldn't do because you, you can now get a 10 year warranty. Um, so you should be able to get that warranty. And, and by the way, anyone who's doing any, even even a flat conversion now, mm. you have to have that 10-year warranty. In the old days, we never bothered. We never no. needed it on mm. conversions, but you do now. So you must get a 10-year warranty. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, I think um, watch what you're doing would be the expression there, don't you? Yes, I think with new build, definitely, yeah. yeah. Do you have any such schemes in France, Joanna? Do, are they trying to encourage self-build there? Um, well, they actually, the, France is very green, so they were, what they do encourage is, bearing in mind most properties or a lot of properties in France are quite rural, what they are encouraging is things like insulation, solar panels on barns, so they're trying to encourage um, more greenness or eco-friendly with old properties, and they offer huge grants, I mean at the moment, they, you know, in, in my village for example, they're telephoning people and asking if they want their roof insulated for a euro, and that's basically 
absolutely what it costs. Um, they do encourage new build for young families, etc. And there are huge amounts of grants available, whether it's for heating, insulation and things like that. There are small companies in the cities that will help with young couples and go through the whole process. So you would sort of instruct them to new build. Um, but, there's, but there is huge amounts of grants, which makes a, a big difference if you want to self build. Um, with regards to new build, it's probably not so common in the countryside areas and bearing in mind France is huge, um, but in cities like Paris and the Alps, they do do quite a lot of new build there as well. Um, and they do encourage that. They do encourage that, you know, particularly if they're eco-friendly. Just something you said there, I'm all for having lofts insulated and incentives to do that kind of thing. I, I think I shudder at the thought of solar panels on the roof of beautiful rustic barns across France. And in the same way that I worry about all these wretched windmills in the sea here. I, it's not the wind, windmills creating the electricity now. It's when we find something else and the trend moves off to something else. Are they going to take all these windmills down and get rid of them that are blighting our landscapes across the country? I really don't know. But they only have a, t a time span of 10 years, apparently. So what's going to happen to them after that? I mean, they're putting them all across France. They're everywhere in France. They're even going into local countryside villages where there's hardly any wind, but then they put them up 200 metres high to get the wind. So I think we're going to see a lot more of them coming. I think we are. And, and actually, in the UK, we, we are the leaders in 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 in, in the energy, wind energy. We, mm. we, we are the leaders mm. in the world, just about. Mm. Something else we lead. Just I, think, I think the one innovation I really do like, I think it, I think it's being tried in Germany now, which it, which is charging your electric cars through contacts in the road. Yes. So as you drive yeah. along, you charge. Far more sensible. Yeah, I really Far like that. Far more sensible. I, I like that kind of technology. I Definitely. Think that's okay, well, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So let's go to the break and we'll see you after our commercial break. You are watching Property TV. You are watching Property TV. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with Joanna Leggett and John Howard. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Joanna, your second question. I understand that in order to relocate to France and indeed buy my retirement home, I will have to demonstrate that I have sufficient funds upon which to live. I also understand that the maximum length of the residency visa is 10 years. I have two questions. What level of savings would I have to show and would that be calculated on the full 10 year period? Secondly, what would happen at the end of my first 10 year period if my savings had diminished somewhat and I fell short of the required level of savings for the next 10 year period? Could I find that in my early 80s, I could be expelled from the country and forced to move back to the UK? Well, that's a bit dismal, isn't it? But it's probably, <laughs> it's quite a worrying factor, I would think. Yeah, and it's and it's also we you know we don't have a crystal ball. If we went back ten years ago, we never would have expected Brexit to happen. Um, so you know, in ten years' time, we can't say what the new rulings will be. But the good thing is that France said they would be quite generous in the respect of um, you know what you'd need to show as income, and they have been that for a household. And this isn't for an individual. You just have to prove that you have the same amount of money as uh, as the RS, RSA, which is a social security amount of money so you'd need to prove that your household whether that was two people one person unfortunately or six people um, has an income of 565 euros per month um, so if you're a couple that's under 300 euros each per month to prove um, if you're not working and you don't have any other income and um, that you can support yourself with that um, now every case is looked at individually so if that's not a pension that's coming in, but perhaps a relative, um, an outside relative is paying that amount into an account for you, and um, that would be accepted as well. If you have a certain amount of savings, which would cover that amount over a 10 year period, that would be accepted as well. Um, obviously they're not gonna throw people out in 10 years time. Uh, well, we, well, we hope not um, with that sort of, under that sort of circumstance, but we don't know. But I think what we do need to look at is that, you know, 
non-Europeans, for example, Americans who live here, Australians who live here, and other nationalities that are non-EU, just renew their carte de jour every, every 10 years as they have done. Um, you know, and it hasn't been a problem, and we've never heard of a story of, oh, that Australians had to leave because, you know, they didn't renew his carte de jour. So there's been loads of nationalities that have been doing that for you know, many centuries, or not centuries, decades, should I say, anyway. Um, so I, don't, I can't see there being a problem. But the good thing is we were expecting you know, the figure to be over a thousand or 1500 euros a month, and it's actually only 565. So it is a really good amount. And is there some kind of, um, if you owned your property, and again, you're at the end of your retirement period or the end of your visa period, presumably you could do some sort of equity release scheme, could you? Do they, do they have that in France? Yeah, I mean, they do have equity release schemes here, as they do in the UK. So that is a possibility as well. You could take out some of the equity. You might want to sell, you know, if you've been there 10 years. I know that in 10 years time, my house is, I definitely don't want to be looking after all this land um, and stuff like that. So in 10 years time, I'll probably sell down. So again, you might release um, um, income from, from larger properties, because everyone, when they first come here, they do tend to buy bigger than what they end up with, or they just, they tend to buy rural properties and then end up in a, in a village or a town or a city um, because they don't want to be so up, so much isolated. Um, so there's lots of different variations, but um, at the end of the day, you know, if you own a property in France and you've been here 10 years, I've never heard so far of any other nationalities being asked to leave when their carte social runs out. I think I think you're right. I think when, as you get older, you want the infrastructure around you, don't you? And you want everything to be ultra convenient, possibly without a drive or mm. without. Well, a the long good walk. news is we can both afford to go. I'm so talking on your behalf, of course, Steve, but we can both retire in France by the sound of things. So that's good news. I, isn't think, it? I think you're having a laugh. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd give up work years ago. They seem I'm, I'm, well. Me I'm, too. I'm me struggling too. Struggling on. We both are. We both are. But, um, you know, it just shows how keen they are for people to move to France, doesn't it, really, by the, you know, by the amount of money they're talking about. It really isn't very much at all, is it? Well, I'm just feeling a bit jealous. I'm listening to Joanna talk about all her land and her mm. estate there. I was, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's not that much, but it is much like, you know, when you've got to look after it in 10 years' time. So I am 10 years' time. I'm, a, I'm your 10 years' time, and it is a pain, mm. I can tell you. And, and so, here's, here's me looking out of the window of a little flat across the road here. Yeah, a little flat, yeah. <laughs> We've seen, I've been there, it's not that little, anyway. You could swap it for a chateau, you know, in once. Could yeah, I? could yeah, show it for <laughs> Okay, well, it looks like I need to seek your advice, Joanne, I really, really do. Okay, um, John. Yes. Um, I'm looking to buy my first home and I think mm -hmm. I prefer to buy a new build property. Yes. Would I reasonably be allowed to ask the builder to make some customised changes to the property once I've reserved it? In addition, could I ask, if I do ask for changes to be made, will this affect my warranty or reduce the builder's responsibility to rectify any problems during the warranty period. Now, well, as, a, as a developer, you're going to have this all the time, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, and don't don't go asking me if, if you can change anything because the answer is very simple. Yeah. No, you can't. What's the question? The answer is no. The, yeah, exactly. And the reason for that is the reason the reason I have a policy that I don't change anything is because it's it's just so difficult. Because someone says to you, oh, you know, I don't like the colour scheme. Um, my, you know, I don't like the. I want to upgrade the kitchen or whatever it might be. It's just so difficult for us to do so halfway through a project. Mm. So what we tend to say is, look, get it completed. We'll give you the name of the contractor who's done it for us, and you can do what you want with them. But we're not involved. We're not involved. So what I would say, if they change anything after completion, uh, then the warranty probably, you know, the warranty, if it's a kitchen, you'll have a warranty from the kitchen manufacturers anyway. If, if, it's, it, if it's construction, you'll still have that warranty in place. Um, and if it's before, you'd have a you'd have a complete warranty on everything from 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 the builder. But if you change it, um, then clearly you won't have. But you'll still have the warranty from the manufacturer, say it's a kitchen or mm. bathroom or something like that. I mean, in the past, where it becomes a problem, it's normally normally a problem for first time buyers. It's normally a problem you've got a big you're doing a big a big um, you know, a big property, and we've we've put in twenty five thousand pound kitchens. And then the, we drive past the week later and they've pulled them out and put a 50, 70,000 pound kitchen in. And the kitchen sat there out and you just think it's just criminal. Mm. But it, I thought I'd sorted that out because I decided I wouldn't put kitchens and bathrooms in 
I'll do the houses. Look, we do a lot of conversions. So, you know, expensive 800,000 pound conversion, say a property, um, a sale price of 800 or a million. I left the kitchen and gave them a budget for the kitchen and the bathroom. I thought, that's great. That'll, so the, the, that'll solve my problem with it. Didn't do. Struggled to sell without the kitchen. It's amazing, isn't it? They haven't got that vision, the people. P people have got without, no, no, no imagination. Without the kitchen, yeah. it was a problem. Yeah. I put the kitchen in, 25 grand, and they went and spent 75 and ripped it out. So what can you do? Yeah. I, th I think there's two levels here. Though. I think for the smaller developer, it's, it, it's, it's probably a little easier to, to uh, Yeah, the big to house builders value. will not change anything. No. The only time they'll give you a choice is, is where just before exchange of contracts, mm. they may give you a Choice of tiles or wall colour. You say color, that. You say that. You to, say that, Stephen. But the problem the is, exchange. yeah. But the problem is, you ask for something different, which is a bit perhaps out of the ordinary. Mm. They do it. You don't exchange. Mm. They're then stuck with a mm. uh, a product that they probably mm. wouldn't have picked. Mm. So I don't think anyone will I, do I, it to I, exchange. I'm talking a lot of the house builders, John, who will have a choice of three things: three three different yeah. tiles, well, four get, different colours. You know. I'm like I'm like what's his what's his name? The Ford, the Ford. Henry Ford. Henry Ford. You, have any you can have you any like. colour as long, long as it was black, wasn't it? Was black, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably a good policy. I think it is for, because you can get, uh, we've tried it and we've got ourselves in a muddle. So, mm. you know, you learn from your mistakes. Mm. And any small developer, you know, if you've got a really strong relationship with a buyer and they've exchanged contracts and paid you a decent deposit, then perhaps you could look at it. But the trouble is, as soon as you start doing one thing for them, they want another, they want another, and they want another. Mm. And in your view, if somebody um, or a developer did agree to those changes mm. and somebody did put them into practice, mm. would it affect their warranty on the overall building? Not, it certainly wouldn't as long as it was would, done before completion. Would you have to go to NHB and tell them they've no. made changes? No, or? no, because no. it's NHB sees really on the constru construction. Okay, <coughs> yeah. no, not on the fittings. It really, I mean, the fittings mm. are covered under different warranties really aren't they okay yeah. great i suppose joanna um france has got a lot more rural areas than we have and, and is a much bigger country so i don't suppose you have the density of new builds there do you really that we have um not so much they do build a lot of allotments and it will be very very similar to the uk you know there'll be warranties particularly for things like the roofs and things right. um and yeah, they do kind of get a choice, but it is a bit of a blank canvas when buying an allotment. Um, but after hearing what John's just said, I'm really thinking about hiring a van and coming over to pick up some of these 25,000 pound kitchens that I, I, left. I don't blame outside. you. I was gutted. Is, 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 is this to put in. Imagine the, how I feel. Is, is this to put in the cottages on your estate, is it? Or? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I've got two empty barns on my estate, um, which are ripe con conversion, but. You know, you've got to look at that when you're buying a property in France, that it's probably not going to add as much value as it's going to cost to convert okay. um, to the property because they'll always have a ceiling, you know, in, in particularly in rural areas. But, yeah, it's, it's very much similar to the UK. You'll get warranties, a few choices with the developers. It depends on the individual developer. OK. All right. Well, um, those lovely barns, just make sure there's no solar panels on the roof. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there won't be. <laughs> well, um, well, well, look, guys, we're, we're at the time of year when we look back over 2021. Um, Joanna, how's the year been for you? Um, well, surprisingly, it's been um, very, very busy. I mean, it's been our busiest year in 22 years. And I said that last year and bearing in mind we're in a pandemic and COVID, but I think it's um, not necessarily because of the British buyers, because obviously British buyers are down. We are actually only down 1% on British buyers, whereas the um, national um, average is 17% down on British buyers because they haven't been able to travel. Although we are, they are traveling now and we have you know, looked at 25% of our sales have actually been done virtually where the client has done everything online from the visit to video. That's amazing. That's amazing. Who would have thought that a few years ago? That's amazing, isn't it? You know, in the old days, I was scared to buy a pair of shoes online. You know, now people are buying houses online. So it's, it, you know, the market has completely changed. There is about, the notaires are predicting that we've, we've done sort of 1.2 million transactions in France this year. And the normal amount is 800,000. So you can see it's a huge jump. Um, and a lot of 
different reasons for this. People in city since the pandemic um, have been looking at perhaps going slightly out of the city into the suburbs so that they can get a balcony, outside space and an office space. Countryside properties are, have hugely gone up. You know, there's so many people that can now commute because now they're being told by the offices they can work from home part time. So they're thinking, well, you know, say, for example, they live in Paris, that in two hours they can be in Bordeaux. So they could buy a countryside home with outside space gardens and things like that. Mm. Um, so it and also, you know, any everybody's looking for somewhere where they can work from home. Um, and if you're selling a property in France, it's obviously really important to show that outside space and broadband access, because broadband, of course, is, is massively important if you're working from home. So the market's completely changed. It's really, really strong. And, you know, going back five years, we might not sell the house for six months. You know, things are selling within three weeks and they're not just generally one person putting in an offer. We might see two or three offers on the same property, particularly in the countryside that we never really saw before. Um, so it's definitely a changed market. And 2021 was very, very strong, particularly for the French market. Good. Well, on that happy note, we're going to end the show. So a big thank you to John Howard. Thank you for coming in. It's John. a pleasure. Joanna, thank you for joining us on Zoom. Good to see you up and about. Thank you. Um, join me next time on Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin. Look forward to seeing you then. Mm -hmm.